Good. Okay. Um, this is going to be something completely different, okay? Because, um, first of all, there's going to be more math in this talk than there was in the last one because I don't understand what I'm doing here as well as I did in the last talk, okay? And I'm still struggling with some of the concepts here. I'm going to be talking about polarization and magnetization, but in not quite the usual way that they're, they're talked about nowadays, okay? So, um, and to tell you the truth, I don't know how profitable this route is going to be in the end, okay? We're going down, we're going in a particular direction, the things we're exploring. I don't know, um, you know, sort of how, how well it's going to work out, but we're having fun doing it anyway. So, uh, oh well. So these are the uh, students and postdocs who have been involved in the work. Um, uh, the most most recently, it's it's Alistair Duff and Jason Catan who who are who are doing things. The the earlier work was done by oh, thank you. The earlier work was done by Perry and Rodrigo, um, and this is funded by our our Canadian funding agency, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. These are Canadian dollars. If you've never seen a Canadian dollar before, this is what they look like. Okay. Okay. There's the thing. Nothing goes forward or back. Well, that's fine. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a little overview first because, as I say, I'm going to be talking about polarization and magnetization maybe a little bit differently than what you're used to. Uh, so I want to try to set the, set, the, set the story. And then I'll review what people do for molecules and atoms and then talk about how we're trying to generalize that to the condensed matter, talk about some of the results we've got, and then a kind of perspective of, of the way we're trying to go with this. And as I say, a lot of this is preliminary, so I'd very much like to hear you know, suggestions and comments. Please be kind, okay? But uh, you know, both, both critical and supportive, it'd be good to hear them, okay? I'm interested in optical properties, okay? So, you know, not DC properties, but optical properties that we're looking at, okay? And suppose I want to do that for a molecule, okay? Suppose I have a molecule, and I know there's, I send in some electromagnetic field, there's going to be microscopic charge and current densities that get induced in the molecule. There'll be some there to start with, of course, but then we'll induce some subject to time-dependent electromagnetic fields. Okay, then what one can do is one can introduce microscopic polarization and magnetization fields. This is just throughout the molecule. Okay, And these satisfy the, the conditions you might expect. Okay, The charge density here can be written as minus del dot p, and the current density as dp dt plus c curl m. Okay. And this is well established in the literature. I'll review some of it for you, but, uh, but it's well established in the literature. Okay? What we want to do is then generalize this to a solid. Okay? But now we also want to include, you know, sort of free charge and free current densities. So the kind of expression we're going to be trying, you know, looking at uh, is something like this. Okay? With the free charge and current densities added in. And then, once we get those expressions, we will then imagine spatially averaging them. Okay? So I'm talking of, I, here I want to talk about a crystal, and at the moment let me just focus on what's going on inside the crystal. I don't want to worry about the surfaces yet. Okay? But we do some kind of averaging. The usual way one talks about things, one averages over some length that's much larger than the distance between the atoms, but much smaller than the wavelength of light. Okay? That's the standard way to think about introducing macroscopic fields, or a standard way. Okay? Well, and then we can, of course, spatially average the microscopic Maxwell equations, and we get that. Okay, And if we define D and H in the usual way, well, then we get the macroscopic Maxwell equations like this, with the, you know, sort of with the, with the free charge and the free current density as, as well as, you know, sort of H and D in here, okay? Now, 
back at this level, we can formulate the dynamics of these microscopic polarization, magnetization, charge and current, in terms of E and B, not phi and A, but in terms of E and B. Okay? And then within various approximations, one can sort of extract the kind of susceptibilities I talked about a couple hours ago uh, that one would write down for, for P and M. Okay? So that's, that, that's the kind of strategy we, we want to do. That's how we want to introduce these macroscopic fields, you know, P, P, M, rho free, and J free, okay? And sort of build up, a dyna build up the dynamics in that way. Okay, so that's, that's the approach. Any, uh, everybody clear with that? Okay. I know you, don't you won't necessarily agree with me, but is it clear? Dave? Yeah. Perhaps you're going to talk about this soon, but you have some freedom in the divergence of the magnetization and the curl of the polarization. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're going to talk about that? I'm going to, yeah. I'll talk about how we get there. Yeah. How we're going to get there. Okay. So. But to start, let me just remind you how it works for atoms and molecules, okay? And as I say, there's a large body of work on this. I mean, I find the most useful author on this is Healy, but different people have their preferences. I've given you a couple of references here, okay? But there's this people, this has been worked on since the 1950s and even, mm -hmm. befo even before then, okay? So, and that is, how does one introduce a microscopic polarization and magnetization field for an atom or a molecule, okay? And let me just begin by illustrating for an atom, and let's say, well, okay, so I've got some, here's my sketch of an atom, of course, there's a nucleus, and this is some kind of sketch of the charge distribution. How am I going to define... And, and, and maybe this charge distribution will change in time because there's a field that's applied or something. How am I going to define a microscopic polarization? Okay. Well, here at least is one way to do it. I want to look at a polarization at a point X. Let's look at every point Y for which there is some charge density. Okay. And then construct a path from my nucleus to that point Y, and this in principle can be any path you want. And now, for every point X that lies along that path, there will be a contribution to this microscopic polarization that's associated with the derivative of that path, a unit vector in that direction. Okay? I'm going to add, for every X, I, I now if I really want this x, I have to consider all the y's and the rows with them and the paths that happen to pass through this point, and I add them all up, okay? And, well, this is the way that's done mathematically, okay? Here's the charge density, and you see this function s. Here's, I, I'm integrating, okay, I'm integrating z along that path from r to y, and at every point, I keep dz, that little tangent vector. Okay? It's easier to think about this if I choose the path to be a straight line, which we normally do. Okay? So then if I have a straight line, I'm just integrating these dz's, you know, from r to y. And if, for example, I looked at the integral of this over dx, well, if I, if I just integrate over dx, I just get a contribution from the delta function, then I have dz, which goes from r to y, so that's going to give me y minus r. So the integral of this microscopic polarization field is just the electric dipole moment of the charge distribution. Okay. So here we are back in the general case coordinate notation, there's a corresponding expression for how I, would in, how I could introduce a magnetization, a microscopic magnetization, in terms of the current density. Okay? And here's what it is, and it involves a more complicated thing. Okay? And these, these quantities, this S that I told you about before, and the alpha, I won't sort of go through the story here, but you can see it's the sort of thing you might expect. 
there's the you know epsilon i m n here and so on. Okay, these things are sometimes called relators simply because they relate this microscopic polarization to the charge density and the microscopic magnetization to the current density. I think this is most clearly talked about in the work by Healy, although he uses a, a, a notation that I think is more complicated than this, if you can believe it. This is complicated enough. <laughs> okay, and almost always people use straight lines, and I'm, most of what I do in the follow, I'm, I'm going to restrict myself to straight lines for these paths, but whether I use a straight line or not, with these definitions, it immediately follows that J is D rho DT plus C curl M and rho is minus del dot P. Follows immediately, as long as I have charge conservation. Okay? So if I have charge conservation and I define my polarization and magnetization in this way, I have these equations. Guaranteed. Okay. Now, how would I use this to talk about the dynamics of an atom or a molecule subject to an electromagnetic field? Okay. Well, here's what you do. You take the initial wave function, psi of x and t, or field operator, whatever, that you would start with with a minimal coupling Hamiltonian. Okay. I had a minimal coupling Hamiltonian. Start with this, this, this say, wave function. Okay. And then I define a special point wave function, that's what the SP stands for. And it's this, it's my original wave function times e to the minus i times this generalized Pyrrhal's phase. And you see this s, you know, we're doing an integral here from here to here, and we're picking up the vector potential at each point as we go along. If you do a straight line, as I've done here, that's just the Pyrrhal's phase. Okay. Uh, if you use a different path, you'll get something slightly different. So this is sometimes called the generalized Pyrrhal's phase. Okay. And this particular integral here is the Wilson line integral that one introduces sometimes. Okay. So if I do this, I find that my Hamiltonian then, if I write the Hamiltonian that acts on this psi sp wave function, well, look, it's H naught. That's if there were no electromagnetic field. And then I get an interaction term with the, of this microscopic polarization with the electric field. I get an interaction term with the paramagnetic, the microscopic paramagnetism with the magnetic field, and then with the microscopic diamagnetism with the magnetic field. Okay? This comes out immediately. And people who do atomic and molecular physics know this. I didn't. Okay, I had, okay, but it comes out immediately. No, at the moment there is no expansion. I'm about to do an expansion, but there's no expansion yet. This is exact. Okay. Now you might say, what the heck is going on? Because I started out with a minimal coupling Hamiltonian where I had a vector potential and a scalar potential, and I had gauge freedom in how I'm going to choose that vector potential and the scalar potential. Now everything's in terms of E and B. You know, where the heck did my gauge freedom go? Well, it's been replaced by the path freedom, okay? The freedom that we use in choosing this path. And, as I say, we're almost always going to use a straight line, but there's a gauge freedom associated with that path. Okay, now, in terms of expansions, let's take a look at this piece here. Just do expansions in all these pieces. Let's look at the first one here. That one. And now, what I can do here is I can maybe expand this electric field in terms of the electric field at this center point, yeah, plus a derivative, and I do a Taylor series expansion here. Okay? And when I do that and plug that into the expression, well, I get the dipole moment, the electric dipole moment, 
times E at this point. The next term is the electric quadrupole moment times the derivative E at that point, and so on. Right? So in each one of these terms like this, which is exact, okay, I can do an expansion like this and collect higher order moments, both electric and magnetic. If I just look at the leading term, well, the leading term here is just going to be the electric dipole moment operator. The leading term here is going to be the paramagnetic dipole moment operator. Uh, the leading term here is going to involve the diametic, di diamagnetic dipole moment operator, which contains the B field itself. Okay. okay. So this is the story with atoms and molecules. Everybody clear? Any questions on this? with uh, minimal coupling, but why do we have one single wave function? Do, don't we have molecular orbitals or some set of eigenstates? Yeah, I haven't said anything about that yet. I'm just saying there's some wave, I start with some wave function for the atom or the molecule. I haven't done any expansion yet in terms of orbitals. That, that is coming. Sorry. Okay, but one would have to do that, of course, to actually make a calculation. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay? But this is expansion free as it were, right? This just involves these operators and the electromagnetic field, which I am treating, I am treating classically here. I'm treating the electromagnetic field classically. I'll come, come back a bit to that later. Okay? All right. Yeah. Uh-huh. I know this, that it's called PWZ Hamiltonian. Yes, yes, exactly. Power, Zeno, and um, Woolley. No, well, at, at the moment I'm treating the electromagnetic field classically. Uh, you, you can generalize this to treat the electromagnetic field quantum mechanically. Uh, when you do the expansion, um, it, 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 what comes out just comes out. Okay. I, it's, I mean, I was very surprised when I learned this that I hadn't learned it before I learned it, okay? I think this is a part of the literature that is not as well appreciated as it should be. And it's partly because there was a lot of confusion in the early days, and it was largely due to the work of Healy that everything got straightened out and organized. So, as I say, if you're going to... I would suggest that the best place to look at this is in our papers because we put all this stuff in appendices, okay? Because it's, it's, it's not so clear in the literature. But it, uh, in the literature, the clearest source is, I think, Healy's book. All right. Now, uh, what is so, so this is atoms and molecules, and you know. I, you know, I have a chunk of condensed matter and it's made up of atoms and molecules. So, you know, can I start with this and, you know, somehow leverage this and go forward? Okay. So let's see what happens. Well, here we go. Okay. I now, you know, let's say I think about gallium arsenide. I have my block functions and so on. And Originally, let's say we start with filled valence bands and empty conduction bands. Okay? And now, if I want to do something like what we did with atoms and molecules, I have to think about wave functions that are you know, centered around a particular lattice site and so on. And that immediately gets us into Vanier functions. Okay? And that was fine. I was comfortable with that. But then I discovered, by reading the papers that some of you have written, that this forces me to understand topological properties. Okay? And on this, I am very uncomfortable. Okay? I know less of this than anybody else in this room. I can guarantee you. All right? So uh, any, anybody who wants to talk about this and how topological things enter, that would be great. Okay, I have, I have been dragged kicking and screaming into worrying about topological issues. Okay, but here we go. 
So gallium arsenide, okay, fine. For the filled valence bands, I can construct exponentially localized Vanier functions, okay? And for enough, and, and uh, when I do that, it's going to involve the kind of formulas that uh, David Vanderbilt wrote down the other day, okay? So uh, for a valence Vanier function type, there'll be different types. They'll be associated with lattice sites, some normalization things. I sum over the valence bands with a unitary matrix, okay? Uh, this is basically what came out of the Vanderbilt group, <laughs> okay? Um, and I can construct my Vanier functions this way associated with the valence bands, and I can also consider uh, Vanier functions associated with the empty conduction bands. So let me start with a simple case like this first, and we'll talk about more complicated topology things later. So once I do, I, pay, I do this and I build my Vanier functions. Here's a little cartoon. This is one Vanier function and maybe this is another Vanier function. And as you know, these Vanier functions are going to be orthogonal with respect to the type and with respect to the lattice site. Now the problem is, when you, if, you, if you try to use these Vanier functions the way that the the way that we proceeded for just an atom or a molecule, you have to introduce something that multiplies this Vanier function by this, uh, by a, you know, this, this, this kind of Wilson integral, that thing with the generalized Pyrrhus phase. The Vanier functions themselves are mutually orthogonal, okay? But these things will not be. Okay, because these functions will, you know, for different R, well, they'll be whatever they are, okay? These, this will not be a set of orthogonal functions. But I, I need these, or I need something like this because, well, it just turns out when you do the equations that you, you, you need something like this in the game, okay? But quantum chemists know how to handle a problem like this, okay? You can start with a set of functions that are almost mutually orthogonal, and you can use a scheme to construct a set of functions, I call them W bar alpha R, that are mutually orthogonal, and they're as close as they can be to the original functions you started with. Okay? Okay. That's what we're going to do. Our field operator, or wave function, we're going to expand in terms of these adjusted uh, Vanier functions. What do these adjusted functions, Vanier functions, look like? Well, you can write them as, well, an exponential of a, of a generalized Pyrrhus phase, that's this quantity down here, times, these, times a set of functions chi. These functions are not mutually orthogonal. But it turns out they're independent of the electric field and they depend only on the magnetic field, only on a gauge independent part of the electromagnetic field, okay, the magnetic field itself. And in the limit of a small magnetic field, you can do a nice little expansion. They're almost the Vanier functions. There's another piece here that involves this delta quantity here. And this delta quantity is these phase factors integrated from you know, sort of R to R prime, or sorry, R prime to R. R, sorry, let's do it this way. R to Y, Y to R prime, R prime to R. And you see this involves an integral of A around this loop. So that's going to involve the magnetic flux in here. So that is gauge independent in the electromagnetic sense. Okay. So I'm going to use these functions here. As, as the functions in which we're going to expand our field operator. Okay? Everybody with me? Or? Okay. Yeah? Sorry, I just got a little bit lost. Yeah? I'm a little bit lost. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I understood that on the previous slide that we were just adjusting the, the Vanya functions yeah. multiplied by this phase in order to make yeah. them orthogonal. And, and those were those psi's that you had written down. And what's the relation between those and these W bars now? The, the W bars, the W bars are the ones, uh, here we go. The W bars ah. are the ones that are adjusted. 
Oh, okay. Thank and you. the point is that they can be written I see. in this way. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. And in, in, in the limit of a small magnetic field, I, I can give you an exact expression as or an expansion. Okay. Okay. So now let me just sketch out how the dynamics is going to work. So this is, as I say, a sketch of the guts of the calculation. So here's our field operator, which we're expanding in terms of these W bars. And I'm going to introduce an effective density operator, okay, that involves creation and annihilation operators at different, different types and different lattice sites. And, well, this phase factor has to get thrown in there. How do you know that? Well, I, I can't tell you why this has to be in there, I just know it has to be, because I want this thing to be gauge and I want this thing to be gauge invariant in the electromagnetic sense. And it will be if I throw that phase factor in there. Okay, and then one can write down, I, in the independent particle approximation here, I can write down the dynamical equations for this density operator. And it sort of contains the sort of stuff you might expect. There's a kind of commutator with the Hamiltonian stuff. And, well, there's this, there's the, uh, again, another, you know, sort of funny thing here. And there's a funny thing here. And I'll spare you the details, but, you know, magnetic effects live in here because this involves the magnetic flux through that triangle that contains these three lattice sites. And these H's, you know, they describe both magnetic and electric effects, and this thing involves electric effects, okay? And again, I will, I will spare you the details, okay? But the point is that the potentials are gone, okay? There are no potentials here. All the quantities here just depend on the electric and magnetic fields, Yes. Okay. Of a particular type, though, that uses as the basis these, these nice adjusted Vanier functions. Okay. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to introduce, we're going to do, imagine doing the calculation in terms of green functions. So I'm going to introduce a green function associated with site R. And you see what I've got here. I've got my little chi's here that come in here. And this is defined, you know, it's site R. So there's an R and then I'm summing over R prime here. And there's an R and I'm summing over R prime here. This is the most democratic way to associate a green function with a particular site. And it also means that this satisfies a kind of formula as you would expect the green function to satisfy. Okay? And if I do this, then I can also introduce site charge and current densities. Okay, here's a charge density associated with site R. Here's a current density associated with site R. In the usual way one does with, with green functions, this, oh yeah, this is a complicated thing, but you can imagine it. Don't worry about the details. The point is that the expectation value of the charge density is the sum over all these, and the expectation value of the current density is the sum over all those. Okay, this is a valid way to decompose the charge density and the current density in the crystal. Okay, so I've got these site, charge, and current densities. Okay. And now, well, if I think back to the atomic problem or the molecular problem, what would be the obvious thing to do? Well, I introduce microscopic polarization fields and microscopic magnetization fields the way I would do as if each one of these R's, each one of these R's was just an atom. And I put a bar over here for reasons that will become clear in a minute. I hope. Okay. Now, of course, the difficulty is charge conservation for each site is not satisfied. Charge conservation for the whole crystal is, but I can imagine, I could imagine all the charges moving from one half of the crystal to the other half of the crystal, okay? Or something bizarre like that, 
Okay? So these things are not equal to zero. Okay? So what do I have to do? Well, I mean, the question is, what, what can you do? Well, you can certainly introduce a free charge density. So this Q sub R is the total charge associated with this site. Okay? And I'll just put it at the lattice site. And I can introduce, I can then, if you, if you look at the equation for this, you can see I'm going to get contributions to, to the time derivative of this from all the other sites. And that I, that, that's associated with current moving towards this guy from all the other sites. And now I'm going to introduce a link current density. Okay? For every pair, R and R prime, I'm going to use my little s here. So I'm going to introduce a current density that for a given r and r prime, it's going to be non-zero in here. And it's going to involve the current going from r prime to r. So I just introduce this. Just define it to be that. Yeah? How, how do you calculate I, I the current? How do I? How, how do you find I? The ah. It, it comes from those, from those density matrix equations I wrote down. Uh, but this is a non-local effect, and we have uh, gone to Vanier functions and local ones. This right, but that, remember that, 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 that equation for the density operator involved different R's and different R primes. Yes. And that comes out, if you just write down the equation for dq, dt, you get a bunch of pieces, and you can write those contributions from the different R primes like this. That's the definition of that I. Thank you okay. very much. But now I also, to make, to, make what I, to make it possible for me to get what I want to get, okay, I also have to introduce a new contribution, let me call it M tilde of R. Okay? And I'm going to say that, uh, that's gonna, that I'm really going to take a site magnetization, each site magnetization to be M, it, to this M bar that I started with and when I was thinking of an atom, and this M tilde of R that I just find when I do the equations, I have to introduce if I want to get anything nice. Okay? And what is the nice thing I get? Well, I get this. These are now equations for the microscopic charge and current density in terms of microscopic polarization, magnetization, free charge, and current densities. Okay? And these polarizations are the sum of, over all of these. The magnetizations are the sum of these. Okay? And you find, if you try to, and you say, well, yeah, but is this, is this just nonsense? What am I doing here? So you do a few checks. Okay? And one check is you just take a trivial insulator and do linear response. Well, you would expect rho free and J free to be zero. And indeed, they come out to be zero. Okay. And also, this M that we wrote as the sum of these two things, well, for the ground state, if I take the integrals of these things, and divide by the volume of the unit cell, well, for this one, I get the atomic magnetization of the modern theory. It's not surprising, maybe, because the m bars, I started out with an atomic-like quantity. But for the integral of the m tilde, I get the itinerant magnetization of the modern theory. Okay? So the ground state of this gives the magnetization that I would expect from the, it gives the macroscopic magnetization that I would expect from the modern theory and also the macroscopic polarization that I would expect from the macroscopic theory. But now I've got this, these time-dependent equations and the structure of the theory is really now a generalized lattice gauge theory. Okay? Because I have an arbitrary, there could be now an arbitrary variation of the vector and scalar potentials between these sites. Okay? I'm not assuming that the electric field is almost uniform or the mag, this, I could be talking about x-rays here. Okay? 
They're hopping matrix elements that involve a set of states at each site. Okay, those Vanier, those modified Vanier functions I introduce. Okay, in principle they connect every site to every other site, but you know you look at them and you see there's in general a short range. The matrix elements are time in are, are time dependent, but gauge independent. This is gauge independent in the electromagnetic sense. They just involve the electric fields and the magnetic fields. Okay, and they involve the dynamics at each site. Because at each site here, there's this whole, there's the, the microscopic polarization and the magnetization field associated with this site that has all its dynamics. The other dynamics is what we get in the, from the lattice gauge theory. Okay. So, we looked at this, you know, we got the results in the ground state for the modern theory, so we felt happy. Okay, maybe this is not manifestly crazy. So we started looking at some results. I'm primarily interested in nonlinear optics, but you know, you start with the simple stuff first. Okay, so we started looking at some, at, at you know, ground states and then linear response. Okay, and as I mentioned, for the ground state in topologically trivial insulators, we get a P and an M that agree with those of the modern theory. Okay, so we're in complete agreement with the modern theory here. Yes, they're, they're in our, I don't know, I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have it on the slide, but it's, yeah, yeah, sorry. We thought about metals. So yeah, sorry, yeah, of course. This, uh, this modern theory, uh, the, the multiposition part, uh, would basically be the effective G factor, is it correct? Like, in a semiconductor, G factor can be, you know, 550 instead of 45. Yeah. And that basically comes from the magnetic moment. Is that what you're doubling with this, or what, what, what do you mean by coinciding the quarter states? Well, in, in, in the modern theory that's associated with, you know, David and, and Rafael Arresta and, you know, their, their co-workers, there's an expression that they derive for the magnetization. It has all kinds of nice properties, okay? And we get agreement with that. So then magnetization, Chan Hill again, too, right, uh, has two pieces. Yeah, that's all there. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be clear, both of us have two pieces. Let me just stress this. Both of us have two pieces. The sum of the two pieces is the same in the two theories. The decomposition is a little different in the two theories. I think we're using the hard decomposition, if I understood. That's right, yes. Yeah, that's right. That's the, that's the decomposition where we are. Yeah, that's the composition. That, that's the decomposition that we get, which agrees with, with yours, yeah. With a? Through the mic. Am I using the microphone? Yeah. Oh, I, okay, yeah. Sorry, this was just for the people who are watching online or, oh, I'm sorry. or recording okay. or whatever. And so the discussion was that there are two der derivations of the modern theory yeah. uh, to a first approximation. Uh, ours was based on one that decomposes it into a local circulation and an itinerant circulation. As I understand, yeah. that's the one that you're mapping onto exactly. directly. The other one is Chen Yu's group, yeah. uh, who derive it in terms of an orbital moment and a density of states factor. The sum of the two is the same in both theories, so the theories agree with each other, but somehow yours maps more directly onto it's ours. Close. Is that the correct summary? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, that, that's what I would expect, because we did start with the atom, you know, mop piece, and then added the itinerary, what we had to add to make it work, and not surprisingly, that agreed with your way of breaking it up into atomic and itinerant. Okay, then we looked at metals. Well, we haven't really done metals yet, but we've looked at p-doped semiconductors, which is a kind of a model for a metal, okay? So I imagine maybe gallium arsenide with a Fermi level down here. So that's a, that has some metallic-like behavior, okay? And of course, here, now the prop, you know, we're, we want to use these Vanier functions, okay? And to get a set of localized Vanier functions, we have to use this full, this full set of valence bands, okay? 
this is linked to the, I think, the disentangling that uh, David talked about yesterday. So what we do here is we use the full set of valence bands to form a set of Vanier functions. And of course, when we do that here, then our initial density matrix, well, it's, you know, delta RR prime, delta alpha beta, F alpha, you know, the filled Vanier functions are all filled and so on. And if I look at the, the filling factors for, the, for each band, well, it doesn't depend on K because I've got completely filled bands here, and it's either zero or one, okay? Now here, since we're making our Vanier functions out of this whole set of bands and they're not completely filled, well, that's not going to be the story anymore. Right? We're not going to have that. Okay? But what we can still do is we, you know, we've got our expressions for polarization and magnetization, and we wrote them down in this Vanier basis. So we can calculate them in the Vanier basis, and then we can go back to block states. Okay? And in general, that's, that's, that's our general approach here. Right? We're, we're, we're leaving, we're really trying to live in real space and then, you know, go to the block state to help us calculate things and see what's going on. Yeah. Okay, I just have a very quick question about that, going back to the block states. Yeah. So I don't know what the process is of, of, of adjusting the Vanya functions that are multiplied by this phase, uh -huh. which are the ones that you use to then calculate all of your quantities. Is, are you starting from those adjusted functions and then trying to go back to the block states? And is that something that that you can do, like it's an invertible process going between the Vanya and the injustice. Yeah, the, uh, once you adopt yeah. that unitary matrix, mm -hmm. okay, once you have that unitary matrix, then you can go back and forth, of course, okay? So we're gonna, we, we're gonna assume we, we start with some, we start with some, you know, sort of definition for those Vanya functions. And then, of course, we can adjust the unitary matrix and that'll, that'll modify the block functions a little bit. Right? For example, there'll be the quantum of ambiguity with the polarization. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll get to that a bit in a minute. Yeah. Okay, so indeed, here we go. Uh, you know, these, these are our you know, sort of uh, Berry connections. And this, this quantity is going to tell us what happens if we start adjusting uh, you know, when, you know, when we talk about this unitary matrix, okay? And this will change if we change the unitary matrices. Okay. And what we find over here in the, in the topologically trivial case is, well, we get this is the usual expression from the modern theory for the polarization. And the ambiguity, so the quantum of ambiguity sits in this W function here. Over here, well now, of course, we don't have a full occupancy here, right? So we've got an FNK here times the same sort of thing. It's very close. I mean, if I took this Fermi level up to the, to the gap, then this would go to this in the appropriate limit, okay? Let me just leave off those ion contributions so I don't have to write them all the time. There's a gauge dependence here that leads to the quantum of ambiguity and the polarization. Okay. And in this definition here, uh, there's a, a more general gauge dependence. And in fact, there are, you know, in, it's been argued from the perspective of the modern theory that you should not be able to define a polarization for, a met, for the ground state of a metal. Okay? Here, well, we have defined it. We have defined a polarization. Okay? It's gauge dependent, okay? but we have defined a polarization. Okay? Likewise, we can define a magnetization in this way. We don't have to talk about chemical potentials or anything like that. We just we have our Vanier functions and so on and so on. And we can define a magnetization and our magnetization and the modern magnetization are different. They just come out to be different. Okay. And they're different in the result and they're also different in the approach. Okay, because the, in the modern theory, it involves introducing a chemical potential. Here, we just, you know, we have our Vanier functions and we just work everything out in terms of the Vanier functions. So, so the F 
in, in, in the end, will it will be real? Well, here, it, I mean, in, I guess in principle it could if we were doing something that's time independent, but here we've said well, there's a Fermi energy here, and so it's whatever it is to make that Fermi energy work. Yeah, well, that's right, but what... Ah, then I wouldn't do this, then I'll talk. That would be linear response. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay? Well, this is our definition of the ground state polarization, or a definition of a ground state polarization for a metal. Okay. Yeah, so the Fermi level is set here. So it's not surprising that there's an Fn. I mean, Fnk is not either 0 or 1, right? Because some of these bands are partly filled and some are not, you know. But the expression we get for the polarization, work it out in terms of our Vanier functions and so on and so on, but the Vanier functions we build from some empty states and some full states. So when we work that work out that expression back in 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 the Brion zone, this is what we get. So that if you take the different set of Y functions, that would not change, right? So no, it, it would change. I mean, in the same way that there's a you know, there's a quantum of ambiguity here, there's ambiguity here as well. Okay. In both the modern theory and 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 uh, I mean in you know, even for the modern theory, in the case of a topologically trivial insulator, there is an ambiguity in that this quantum of ambiguity in the polarization. Can I just interrupt yeah, and make sure. sure everybody understands there are two different gauge dependences in yeah, the Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. And here when 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 you're talking about gauge dependence, it means a different choice of one A function. That's right. And so it's exactly answering your question. It does sorry. change yeah. the different change of one A functions. That's the sense of yeah, gauge. I'm sorry, here. thank you. Thank you. Okay, 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 um, so we've been playing around with things. We looked at churn insulators in the ground state, and again, well, what's the problem here? We've got um, to make, oops, sorry, this should just say make localized Vanier functions out of an expanded set of bands, which we have to do. We expand our set of bands so we can make localized Vanier functions. And then we get a, a, an expression for the polarization that looks like this. Okay? Now here it involves the filled bands, okay, which are not all the bands that were used to make the exponentially localized Vanier functions. Okay? So we've got a definition here for the pol a polarization, at least in the ground state. And again, if we compare the magnetization that we get here in, in our approach with the modern theory, well, you know, they're different, both in approach and in definition. They, but they, so both, both in the approach and in, uh, to, to defining them and in the result we get, okay? But they both share one feature, both in the modern theory and in our case, the results, both of these, both of our definitions, although they're different, they both seem to be insensitive to changing if we, you know, shift the energy levels of all the bands. Okay. So, there are different expressions for a polarization and a magnetization uh, in general in, in what we've been doing for the ground state and what the modern theory does for the ground state. Point one, okay? Let's look at linear response, okay? Yep. Yep. Maybe you'll get to this in a bit, but something that I've been worried about in this is that um, if I were to take this expression and apply it to, say, a vowel semi-metal, mm -hmm. would it matter if it's compensated or not? I have no idea. I don't know enough about vile semi-metals. That's what I've learned by attending this conference. But, I've learned so that there are many things that I don't know enough about. Um, I ask because your, your treatment of the family level and how it enters here mm -hmm. 
would then state that something that isn't compensated would be a, a problem. But I've always assumed that that would not be a problem. So I'm, I'm, well, lost, I, I, but maybe this is not a question. I, I to think we could, we, I think we could ex define a polarization and magnetization. You know, as long as there's some set of Vanier functions that you can find for which you have exponentially localized Vanier functions, and we know that if you take all bands, right. you can make exponentially localized Vanier functions. So there will be a large enough set where you can make exponentially localized Vanier functions. We would choose, this is an approach, we would choose those and then get whatever expression we got for the polarization and the magnetization. And then for that choice, I could then pick some chemical potential, something that, that works. Um, no, After I'm not, I no, I don't, I, I don't think you could just choose a chemical potential that would make our result agree with the modern theory. Okay. The difference is, the, that. the difference is more, uh, is, is, is more, more than that. Okay, linear response, okay, Sa again, let's do some sanity check. So we go, again, long wavelength limit, so we have an electric field that's just a function of time. Forget about the magnetic field. Here's our general approach. We calculate results in the Vanier basis, convert to the block state basis to, you know, see things. We find, in general, that there will be a free current density and a, and, a, and, a polariza and a current density due to the polarization. And if we write uh, the J in terms of a conductivity times E, uh, in general, both of these are going to contribute to this conductivity. Uh, and in general, we expect to find that these things will be gauge dependent. This is gauge in the block function sense, okay? But we would expect uh, the total current density to be gauge independent, of course. Okay. Okay. Uh, for an insulator, this is what we find. Okay. And if we take the limit to omega goes to zero, we get the quantized anomalous Hall current. Okay. Which, in the way we're doing things, is completely associated with the free current. It's the free current that leads to this effect. If we go to a topologically trivial insulator in linear response, there's no free current, and for the polarization, we get the standard expression. Okay. And in fact, uh, there'll be no free current for a topologically trivial insulator. There'll be no free current in linear response, no matter how complicated the electromagnetic field is in the way we're doing things. For a metal, if we have time reversal symmetry, then the free current uh, and neglecting scattering effects, the free current diverges as omega goes to zero. We can associate that with intraband effects. P of omega is finite as omega goes to zero. We associate that with interband effects. It's more complicated if we don't have time reversal symmetry. Um, I haven't got, haven't got enough time to go through that. So let me buy, I can talk about that later with anybody who's interested. Still in linear response, but now we would like to go beyond the long wavelength limit. Okay? So I want to worry about the situation where maybe the elect I have to worry about the variation of the electric and magnetic fields a little bit over a unit cell. Okay? So for, say, the current density, we can introduce the Fourier transform. And if I, I can write B in terms of E, if I use Faraday's law, and then I can look for a, a kind of expansion of J, right, in powers of, now, only single powers V because it's linear response, but I can look at the different powers of Q, right? This is the zeroth power in Q, here's the first power in Q, second power in Q, and so on, okay? So this one here is responsible for things like the frequency-dependent generalization of the magnetoelectric effect. Also, optical activity, and so on, and so on, okay? And, well, we, uh, we work this out, you know, and we keep all the terms, you know, what, what do we got here? Well, we've got, we have to worry about the electric dipole moment per unit volume and how that depends on B and also the symmetric uh, derivative of the electric field. 
and we have to worry about the magnetic dipole moment per unit volume, how it, it, it depends on E, and the electric quadrupole moment per unit volume, how it depends on E. These are the terms that contribute to this piece. And, oh yeah, we, we included electron spin too. Okay. These pieces individually turn out to be gauge dependent in the block function sense. But this term is gauge independent. Okay? You add them up, you get something that's gauge independent. Okay? So we have a gauge independent expression for this. Okay? If you look at this term, oh yeah, right, yeah. No, all these make a contribution. We're at finite frequency, right. large frequency. So I imagine a large frequency. Oh, maybe, maybe could you do the insulator? And insulator. Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. This is just insulators. All we've done so far on this is for insulators. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You don't get these. You don't get well, but you don't look at it this way, right? If you do a Kubo calculation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But in any case, I mean, we wanted to check with our little, okay, that we could we could certainly get something that's gauge independent. Um, yeah. And now we've moved on to this piece here, okay, which is more complicated. There's many more contributions. We're almost done, but it does come out to be gauge independent. And interestingly, if you take the omega goes to zero limit of this term, you get the static magnetic susceptibility. That lives in this piece. And you might say, well, everybody knows what the static magnetic susceptibility for an insulator is in the independent particle approximation, but that's not true. There are fights in the literature <laughs> over what the right expression is. Okay? And we think we've pinned that, we think we've pinned that down. Uh, we discovered some sum rules that people had not found, and we get our expression in agreement with other expressions in the literature for that. Okay? And as I say, that's the omega equals zero limit. Uh, we think we've pinned down that, and we're still trying to convince a referee of that, but we think we've pinned that down. Um, and um, as I say, this, is, this certainly is gauge independent. Okay, um, we are working on nonlinear response. I'm almost done. Okay. We are working on including quantum optical effects. Okay? Let me just finish up a little bit with a perspective, okay? Because you're probably thinking, why is he doing all this stuff? You, know? you could say, well, okay, here's this, but you know, why do you introduce these P's and M's and so on? You know? Why not just work with microscopic charge and current densities? You know, and just do it that way. Well, first of all, it's just interesting to see if you can do this. But the other thing is, it leads, it leads naturally to describing the interaction through E and B rather than phi and A. And that simplifies a lot of calculations. And also, well, we feel that, you know, introducing these separate terms, you can see the physics uh, in, in some of these separate terms and what's going on. And it's easy to take the molecular crystal limit, where we can take the different unit cells and completely separate them to isolated molecules and see what survives and what doesn't. Okay? Now, of course, if I have an expression like this, and I redefine my, I introduce a new P and a new M and a new rho free and a new J free with, you know, functions little a of x and t, capital C of x and t, scalar b, and, you know, all this stuff. You get exactly the same charge and current density. Right? And in fact, in the old days, before people, when people were worried about just finding electromagnetic fields from from given charge and current densities that were thought to be, you know, just microscopic or something. 
they, they actually introduced P and M, and they called them polarization potentials and magnetization potentials because they could be used to calculate rho and j, and they simplified some of the mathematics. So what we would like to do is ultimately, you know, if we get everything pinned down and sorted out, we would like to use this opportunity to think about, well, you know, how do we choose our Vanier functions and therefore our polarization and magnetization maybe in a way to help in approximate descriptions of the electron-electron interaction and, you know, how does that help us, you know, sort of understand, you know, sort of what's going on with, a, you know, sort of if it does help us understand what's going on with the bulk, uh, you know, surface correspondence. But that is all wishful thinking, okay? But we're, you know, still hoping to get someday uh, to the, uh, the optical alchemy of nonlinear optics with this. So thanks very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to get any comments. Okay. I think comments over lunch would be more than welcome. Sure, yes. Yep, of course.